Hello everyone, Mary Rose here at Stitch Bliss Corner. Um, I'm just doing a little segment today on Valentine's Day. Uh, I was just having a look to see what the origin of Valentine's Day was and I found it quite interesting. And then, somehow or other, it led on to Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers which I suppose there is a connection because uh, uh, Fred Astaire's films were mostly about romance and how he get himself into all these tangles and after plenty of dancing um, the tangles were usually resolved in the end uh, and everybody left the theatre a lot happier and a lot more energised than they were before they went in which I think is probably uh, what they were aiming for with these films because most of them were made in the 30s when life was very grim in well across the world but also in America and people could listen to the radio because it was free and they used to uh, you know listen to the equivalent of Sophie's and uh, uh, well, the music, of course, comedies, sports broadcasts, something that would take them out of themselves for a while. And the movies, people you could usually scrape together enough to go to the movies. And you can imagine that if your life was very difficult and times were hard, you never knew where, if you were going to have enough to feed the family. Well, I don't know if family people went so much as maybe the younger people and uh, singles, you know. I suppose they had enough money to for, to take the kids occasionally, but just generally couples, I expect, used to go and dream of better times, dream of better futures. They'd go in there and they'd be transported into a life of incredible fantasy, I should imagine because a lot of the 30s and 40s musicals in particular, the more extravagant scenery and the more sp sparkling, glistening clothes that they could get in there, the better. You know, they used to fit pretty much anything that they could lay their hands on to make it so that you'd be almost back in your seat. A gog <laughs> at... Uh, at what was up there and you know some people might think well why would you do that I mean wouldn't that make them feel even more deprived um, going to the movies and seeing things like that but I think it w it didn't really have that effect from what I can understand I think it just made them uh, a little bit more optimistic about what could happen maybe maybe you could head off to Hollywood and make a, make it, you know, become famous. Who knows, you know, uh, it, it sort of, a lot of them were ranks to riches stories in the movies. Um, so I think it did uh, set people on paths that they probably would never have dreamed of uh, had they not gone into that movie theatre and sat there and watched some person on the screen going from very poor beginnings to tremendous wealth. Well, it's, it seems like money was the thing that you were after, uh, probably because so few people had it. <laughs> Whether or not the money that was attained by certain individuals that aimed to uh, become famous or whatever they may be doing whether or not they actually got the happiness they were hoping for is quite another story. Um, anyway, that's a little bit later. We need to get to Valentine's Day and its origins. So Valentine's Day, February the 14th, and it's the annual festival to celebrate romantic love, friendship and admiration. Couples send Valentine's Day cards and flowers to honour their love for each other. Now, if you go back to ancient Rome, which is where 
the legend of Val St. Valentine began anyway. Um, they had a festival called Lupercalia and it was in the middle of February and it officially uh, marked the beginning of springtime and it was basically a fertility uh, festival from what they call pagan times. When Valentine was alive there were many Romans converting to Christianity. Now Emperor Claudius II was not a Christian. I do have some pictures here. He was not a Christian and created strict new laws on what Christians could and couldn't do. Well, he was in a bit of a, a jam actually, Claudius too, from what I can see of it, because the borders of Rome were being attacked constantly. And because of that, they needed a very strong army. And Claudius found that the men weren't that keen to go and fight if they had a family and children. Um, so <laughs> he basically ruled out soldiers getting married. <laughs> he thought that might fix the whole thing. Uh, now, there he is there, Emperor Claudius II. Uh, it's a gilded bronze bust hidden beneath the Capitoline Temple in Brescia, B-R-E-S-C-I-A, unearthed only in 1826. But he does have the look of a leader there. He's got the strong jawline, hasn't he? And I can just imagine him saying, you know, well, we can fix our problem by just telling these blokes they can't get married. Uh, there's a more, another picture here of him in later years by the looks of it. And he looks as though he's softened a bit round the edges there because the nose looks different but you know they do say your nose grows anyway and your ears as you get older um, he was also known as Claudius Gothicus anyway that was the man so let's have a look he passed a law forbidding uh, them to marry as he felt single men made better soldiers now, Valentine, and his name was Valentinus, he was a priest at the time, a Christian priest, and he defied the emperor. And in secret, he kept marrying these couples that wanted to get married. Um, because he believed that love was more important than anything else. Uh, so eventually, Valentine's secret ceremonies were discovered and he was jailed for his crimes. Um, well, in prison, Valentine cared for his fellow prisoners, uh, which, <coughs> excuse me a moment, which isn't uh, surprising because it sounds like that's the sort of person he was. He sounds like a very caring person. Sorry, I just had to attend to something. Um, right, so here, back to Valentine. One other incident occurred that makes Emperor Claudius II rather noteworthy, and that concerns some trouble of a religious sort. Persecution of Christians was rather intermittent in the Roman Empire, with periods of fierce persecution being followed by long periods when anti-Christian laws were relaxed or left unenforced. That might have been in times of peace, I suppose, when they didn't have to concern themselves with numbers of, of men for the armies. Some of these laws were being enforced in the reign of Claudius II, and there was a certain Roman priest who came to the attention of the authorities. He had become well known for administering the sacraments in violation of the law, particularly, it seems, for secretly marrying Christian couples. He was arrested, but still carried on converting people to Christianity. Severely beaten and stoned, the priest did not die and was brought before Emperor Claudius II. Rather than beg for his life, he tried to convert the emperor to Christianity. That did not happen, and due to his persistence, he was ordered to be beheaded. While awaiting execution, 
he converted the blind daughter of the governor of his prison to Christianity, and while praying for her, her blindness was healed. The grateful girl would remain faithful to his memory for the rest of her life, long after the priest was martyred on February the 14th, 269, cherishing a last small note he had written to her, which the healing power of Christ had enabled her to read, which ended with the words, From your Valentine. Now, there's a little bit more there. Uh, 200 years later, Rome had become Christian and the church proclaimed February 14 at Saint Valentine, as St. Valentine's Day. <clears throat> the Pope did this by replacing a pagan fertility festival with St. Valentine's Day and established it as a feast day on the Catholic calendar of saints. In the Middle Ages, Chaucer the poet linked St. Valentine with romantic love a form of courtly love that was usually secret. Um, you know, the secret admirer part where you got a note from someone and you didn't know who it was from. I mean, you fervently hoped it was some good-looking bloke <laughs> or girl. <laughs> uh, but who knows? Uh, the custom spread. Uh, love messages developed into card making with special love verses inside. Often they were decorated with cupids, hearts and flowers, lace and ribbon. And it looks here as though Emperor Claudius too, he had a coin. And I also have a denarius here that I got when we lived in England. Can I just see if I can get it out? This is from Vespasian's time, AD 69 to 79. Uh, and maybe that was in the pocket of some of these married people that went and got married by St. Valentine. It's amazing to have something from those times. I mean, actually, Roman coins are quite um, common. They're not very expensive, really, on the scale of things, because there were so many of them. But this is precious to me. <laughs> so anyway, that's just a little aside there. Now, here is a picture of St. Valentine. That's lovely, isn't it? Put the, the roses there. And another one, an icon here that was made of him. So if you're going to be a saint, to be a saint that's remembered for prizing love above anything else would be quite something to be a saint of, of that. Right, so now I'm going to go on to the Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers and as I was saying before during the time of the, the Great Depression when people were grinding out life you know I mean really you run out of something and it's like the end of the world <laughs> but then you need to remember or you don't need to remember I'm just saying to remember times gone by when things were so so hard you know, that you just didn't know if you were going to be thrown out of your house. Um, I can remember my mother saying that her mother, um, in her mother's time, uh, where if you were living, you know, you'd be in your house, and if you said that you didn't have enough money, uh, for rent collector or something like that. They would come round to your house and have a look and see what you had. Well, you can sell that chair there. You know, you can... And they used to just take it, if that was the case. If you were behind, you know, they'd take it. And then if you couldn't afford your rent, you're out on the street. You know, there are no safety nets or anything like that in times gone by. And um, 
children had no shoes, you know, I mean, it was just incredibly difficult. Uh, but anyway, um, sorry, I'm just waffling. Um, so they had ways of escape, I suppose, into some other mindset. And so they had the big dance halls and they had the big band music. And for, you know, not that much money, you could go in and dance all evening. <laughs> and uh, that was a good place to to do that and to get rid of some of that nervous energy that, well, you know, if you're a young person, I mean, if you're an older person, you probably didn't have that much energy because you were malnourished and everything. But the younger people, it, it was something for them to do. So, um, here is a picture of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. And look at that dress. Stitches do come into history. Lisa Kay is perfectly right. She always tells her family that stitching is relevant to everything. So I'm going to just do a little bit about the film Swing Time because at the bottom of this video you'll find three clips. Now the two are self-explanatory, the first two. One's, the first one is amusing, you just need to look at his face at the end of it. They're only about three minutes long. The second one is an example of the incredible dancing that Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers are so famous for. And the third one also shows uh, the wonderful dancing skills they had, uh, but it also has a little pick-me-up uh, for the music that is playing. I've got the words there, just for the final one. So now we can go on to Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. And the film that I've picked out to talk to you about was called Swing Time, and it was made in 1936. my little piece of information here. Now I've got three clips underneath this video. The first one, they're all from Swing Time, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. And the first one is where Fred is sings to Ginger. And you just could pay attention to the look on his face at the end of that clip. Uh, the second clip shows their remarkable dancing skills and the way Ginger uses her dress is, you know, she always managed to feature it to make beautiful shapes as she danced. And then the last one is a polka uh, with tap dancing. I mean, it's just, your eyes feel like they're deceiving you. I mean, they look as though they're weightless. They always do look weightless when they're dancing. I mean, it it looks effortless. And it, you know, you know yourself, just trying to, when you dance around a room, you know, you can't, you, you don't look weightless because you're not weightless, but they make it look that way. Sorry, anyway, so, uh, in the first clip, he sings The Way You Look Tonight, which is a beautiful song. And it has been used in modern films as well. But I thought perhaps there might be some people, some younger people, that have not seen Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers dancing. And I think that would be terribly, terribly sad to not see these two, because they were magical, there's no doubt about it. And I mean, especially against the uh, depressing times that you could go in off the street and watch them, uh, you'd have to come out lifted and feeling just that little bit better. Um, 
Anyway, so it was made in 1936. Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Ginger played the character Penny Carroll and Fred played the character John Lucky Garnet. And that usually was the case in these films, uh, you know, for some reason or, reason or another. Fred was in a dilemma of some sort. And uh, by the end of the film, all was resolved and everyone was happy. Um, the song was written by Jerome Kern and the lyrics are by Dorothy Fields. And Dorothy Fields later remarked, the first time Jerry played that melody for me, I went out and started to cry. The release absolutely killed me. I couldn't stop. It was so beautiful. Uh, Fred Astaire topped the charts with this recording in 1936. And The Way You Look Tonight was given an Academy Award for the Best Original Song. Um, yes. So I'll show you some pictures of these two very shortly. Just see if there's any... I mean, you might want to pause and just have a look at these clips. But if you don't, that's fine. <laughs> um, now, the plot, just generally, the plot of Swing Time was that Lucky was supposed to be marrying someone and he got delayed on the way to the wedding and the father of the bride called the wedding off and he told Lucky that if he made the princely sum of $25,000, uh, <laughs> then he would be permitted to re-ask for his daughter's hand in marriage. Turned out that he headed, headed off to New York to make his fortune. And then he met Penny. I think her name was Penny. Well, that, the, the, it was Ginger's part. Yeah, Penny Carroll. She was a dancing instructor. And they didn't get a lot of money and it was bad, you know, hard times. And um, anyway, she was looking like she was going to get the sack. And Fred, or Lucky, he went into this dance studio and uh, he pretended that he didn't know how to dance and totally frustrated her and got her very annoyed. Anyway, then Fred saw that she'd got the sack and she was walking out. And he grabbed hold of her hand and took her back to the owner of the dancing academy and just said, oh, I just want to show you how good a teacher she is. And that's the final clip that I've put in where they do the polka tap dance and even jump over a little barrier on either side of the dance floor. Incredible. Anyway, noted dance critic Arlene, I think it's pronounced Croce, it's C-R-O-C-E. She considers Swing Time the best dance musical um, and there are many others that feel the same way. In 2004, Swing Time was selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress as being culturally, historically and aesthetically significant. So there you go, swing time. And I have a picture of the, you know, when you have the poster outside the movie theatres. I'm trying to make that a bit bigger, but whether or not it'll behave is another thing altogether. Yes, there it is, swing time. And here's a still from the movie. Look at that dress. And here are some more here. That's the typical look he's got there as though he's got a secret and she's wondering what it is. Well, he does have a secret, but anyway. <laughs> That's them there. Wouldn't you love to do the costumes for a film like this? 
that's the I think that scene is probably from the dance studio he always looked very dapper with his coronation in his coronation coronation not coronation <laughs> uh, and here they are that's a scene from the um, pick yourself up is the music playing when they do the polka dot the polka um, at the end and uh, well it's not the end of the film but they do the polka and that's the one with the tap dancing in and that's what saves her job that's as I say that's the final clip you can see that and here's another one she used to swish her dress and make beautiful shapes as she danced and as they said Fred was a great dancer marvelous dancer but everything he did she did backwards in high heel shoes and how she danced in those high heel shoes I will never know I mean he had the flat shoes so you know that would have been very kind to his ankles but how she did it I have no idea now I've done that little bit there. Now, here are the lyrics. Now, I thought I'd finish on this. For those Valentine people who haven't got one yet, or, you know, might be still looking, or maybe this Valentine's Day they don't have anyone, or things have not gone well. Uh, from that last clip, the music, pick yourself up. Here are the the lyrics to that. Don't forget, you make the most of all that comes, and the least of all that goes. That's that's me saying that. Because there's always something. There's always something tomorrow. There's always going to be something in the future. So maybe something that you wouldn't have thought was possible. A month or two months or a year ago and that's the thing about life life does that it presents opportunities that you it's one of the reasons why life is unpredictable I mean what sort of world would it be if you knew exactly what was going to happen it it wouldn't be good it would totally dominate your life if you knew what was going to happen. But wonderful things can happen. And from what I can see of it, a lot more good things happen than the other way. You just have to wait it out. I mean, if, the, if there's a bad time that you're having, that anyone's having, you have to wait it out. That's, that's life. That's what it does to you. I mean, no one said life was going to be fair. Uh, you just have to deal with it. Anyway, here, here's, that's not the lyrics. <laughs> Sorry, that's not the lim lyrics of pick yourself up. That's my lyrics. <laughs> right, here it is. Now, nothing's impossible, I have found. For when my chin is on the ground, I pick myself up, dust myself off, and start all over again. Don't lose your confidence when you slip. Be grateful for a pleasant trip. And pick yourself up, dust off, start all over again. So, I think St. Valentine would probably think the exact same thing. And he'd say the exact same thing. He was very positive, a very positive thinking person. You know, he tried to convert the emperor, knowing full well that that wasn't going to end well. But he just kept on keeping on. And that's what we all have to do. Uh, yeah. Well, the other thing we can all do is start stitching and keep stitching. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm always stitching. Any, if I'm not doing something I have to be doing, I'm stitching because that's really all I want to do. Anyway, that's it for now. Um, may I wish everybody uh, happy stitching until next time.
See you again later. Bye for now.